Thank you. Well, that also um, that's helpful. Thank you, Jonathan, um, and welcome uh, to those who know the committee well and those that are brand new. Uh, and if you ever have a question, if you're brand new or even if you're not, um, you know, in between our meetings, which aren't very frequent, you can always reach out to myself as as the chair as well as uh, Jonathan. So with that. Um, I'll give just kind of a brief update on yeah. committee membership, Mark. Yeah. Sounds good. For those of you who uh, committee members who were present at the last meeting, you knew that we had two vacant seats, one for a hospital representative and one for a practitioner organization representative. Um, through some networking and recruitment, uh, network of Mark actually, and then recruitment through OHA, we were actually able to fill those two vacant seats. Um, we have Dr. Ryan with us here today, who is uh, representing Kaiser Permanente, and our hospital representative is Leslie Foltz. Um, unfortunately, Leslie wasn't able to join us today. She was undergoing a medical procedure and is still rehabilitating, um, but we hope to have her present at the next meeting. Um, so for the first time in several years, we actually have uh, a full committee membership, um, full nine members, three firm hospital representatives, three health plan representatives, and three practitioner organization representatives. Uh, I think one little tidbit I'll add is that uh, the two members whose terms were expiring this month, Dr. DeLowry, and I believe um, Hillary Parks were have graciously agreed to extend their committee membership for an additional three years. So thank you for agreeing to uh, continue to serve on the committee. Anybody have any questions or comments in that regard? Yeah, and I just I, I do want to say thank you, Jonathan. Um, you know, we are a statutorily created uh, advisory body uh, and having that that balance uh, is required by statute. So we worked really hard behind the scenes uh, to fill our ranks. And I really want to do thank everyone for the time they spent volunteering uh, for this committee. It's really important work, uh, particularly in the wake of the whole common credentialing project going away. Um, this work becomes uh, ever more important. And I just want to thank you um, for volunteering your time. Absolutely. Is there anything else on that before we move on to the next agenda item? Great. Uh, Jonathan, if you could walk us through uh, the charter, and I believe we prove this uh, every time. Uh, so uh, if anyone has questions on that, um, I'll have Jonathan just guide us through it. Uh, and if there's any questions, we'll take those. Uh, if not, we'll just move on to the approval of the charter. Absolutely. Yeah, just give you a kind of a high level overview for those of you um, who haven't had time to kind of give it a look at some of the more granular details. Basically, it gives a uh, statement about the committee's overall mission and then uh, gives an overview of what committee membership is supposed to look like and uh, where committee membership is supposed to represent uh, within the credentialing world, I guess. And then it kind of delves into current committee membership and statutory authorities that are given to uh, that give authority to this committee. There are no real substantive changes to the charter this year. Um, similar to last year, the only real changes that, that have been made is to reflect current committee membership. So, does anybody have any questions in, in regards to the charter itself? And my apologies for those following along in the packet, that would be starting at page 10 um, of the packet. If there's no questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve, Inga. Approve. Thank you, Inga. Second. I second it, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The motion carries. Fantastic. 
Um, the next item up on the agenda is really more for sort of a quick discussion and, and consensus um, from our expert members around this table. Uh, we there is a, there are a lot of questions that are posed, um, you know, in interim about uh, the forms themselves and other issues related to the forms. Mm -hmm. uh, and in talking with uh, Jonathan over the past few months, um, it it might be nice to have some sort of what folks refer to as sub regulatory guidance, meaning it's not a rule or a statute. Uh, but it is information through like a frequently asked question page that a lot of uh, state agencies now are posting to help address some of the issues. Uh, and, you know, I think it will be helpful to have a brief discussion here if this is something that folks would like to see. Uh, and then, of course, the question is ultimately how do you develop content uh, and what should be contained on like a frequently asked question page? So I think just by the fact that I'm addressing it, uh, it's something that I'm interested in, but I really would like to ha hear other thoughts around this table uh, for folks. And I'll start off with Jonathan uh, to kind of get us going on this discussion. Absolutely, yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, for several years now, um, kind of the technical assistant process has been guided by an email inbox for ACPCI related questions. And, um, I think a lot of them could be the process itself could be streamlined just by having a, a set of FAQs onto the main website. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the questions I get are process related and timeline related. So uh, as Mark stated, you know, I wanted to gather uh, information from the subject matter experts on you know questions you may get within your organization. Uh, that this page could ultimately um, help inform. Got to unmute Dorothy. Um, the main question that I've gotten is uh, after we review the questions or recommendations, um, why certain things aren't approved. And um, I, I think having a, a bit of that information would be helpful. Um, specifically, I know it's in our charter as well, um, but having that probably on the FAQ would be helpful, like um, that information specifically related to credentialing only, information that would be applicable to all parties and not just one particular group of credentialing um, uh, parties, things like that um, would probably be, um, that's the main thing that I get is why something wasn't approved and I think that's kind of a theme okay. of what we review as well. Anyone else? Good idea, neutral, not good idea. I like the idea um, from, if you take it back and look at it from a, the perspective of a new credentialer, um, having any information about how the application is um, formulated, the background as to why we have to do certain things and why we cannot, not granular, but, you know, like we have to follow the OARs and do what benefits the global community. And it's not just one track of practitioner types and that type of thing, something like that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, um, what I think we'd like to do is uh, I can regroup with Jonathan um, with this feedback, uh, which is helpful, um, and we can look at what that structure might look like. Um, I could envision, um, you know, OHA coming up with sort of a, a rough draft of what, you know, those FAQs might be, and then turn to us as sort of the content experts to kind of give, give our eyes on it. Um, before something like that would get posted. I know there's an internal process for all that 
um, at OHA as well. Um, does that sound like a plan? OK. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to process review, um, I'm going to have you kind of walk us through briefly the philosophy, Jonathan, and then I'm going to give my two um, sort of nuggets as to how, you know, I, I, I want to see us approach the proposed um, recommendations for changes as we move forward. Absolutely. I just give you a, a high level view of the process that are involved um, with updating the applications on an annual basis. So each year OHA opens a solicitation period for a six weeks for interested parties to write in and suggest recommendations to the current applications as they stand. Um, then I take those recommendations, compile them into a list that we'll be reviewing today and uh, committee members vote on them, uh, whether yes or no. And then I take the list of approved recommendations to the director of the Oregon Health Authority who ultimately denies or approves. Uh, well, my boss's boss takes it to the director of the Oregon Health Authority. I don't take it to the director. Um, and then we work with the publications department to incorporate those recommendations in the applications and publish them online, which is typically about a two to three month process. Um, I did want to make a slight change to how the process works this year, though, um, just because uh, over the course of the last nine months or so, I've gotten a lot of comments on how uh, the formatting for the 2021 applications and some of the details that were involved were problematic for credentialing organizations. So once we get a final version of this latest application for 2023, I was going to send it over to committee members to review before it's ultimately published online, um, unless committee members have any serious objections to that. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and I also want to add that in terms of timelines for the these meetings themselves, because of the delay that we experienced uh, during COVID and then ultimately last year, we had to hold two meetings to go over all the recommendations for the 2021 applications. It seems that uh, it would be prudent to hold this next meeting. It would be in the winter of 2024 instead of the fall later this year. Um, that combined with the fact that credentialing organizations have 10 months to comply with using the latest version of the applications. I just thought pushing out the next meeting to hold it one uh, in 12 months from now would be beneficial for everyone involved. So. Just a little comment. Um, and we are still uh, adhering to our statutory obligation of convening the meeting every 12 months since we're, we held one in 2022 and now we have one in 2023. So, Any questions on the process itself from committee members? Uh, John, I, I, I do have a question. This is Inga. You know, sure. how do how do our all the employees within the health systems notified um, that you know you have until such and such time to submit questions or changes? Because um, I, you know, I haven't done it, and I personally haven't seen any communication. Is it the members' responsibility, like? to send the emails to our team within the organization to let them know the time frame because frankly my team they don't know hardly anything about this process absolutely yeah and i appreciate you letting me know that uh typically i send out a message through our gov delivery system to our list of subscribers to um, that lets them know when the solicitation periods are open and the deadline for sending in those recommendations to oha um, you know, there's obviously I'll take any recommendations you have to make the process more inclusive. If, you know, a large organization such as yourself isn't being informed, then something we definitely want to look at. Sounds like it could be an FAQ. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
and I probably missed that uh, communication when it went out, but I'll definitely look forward uh, for it moving forward as a way to communicate with my team. But yeah, definitely because it's we are so low, you know, underutilized, I think folks all of a sudden say, oh, a new application. Um, you know, they just don't understand uh, the folks that give the input are usually the same ones every year that provide the input. So having new folks participate and getting that communication out will be most effective. Absolutely. Yeah, and I will say there's definitely a flaw in the process where uh, it's only in this as inclusive as the subscriber list is. So um, definitely a process, maybe we want to reevaluate this year. Um, and I'll have some more conversations with you on that later, Mark. OK, great. Um, and this is good discussion. So again, for back to the two nuggets, um, one of the nuggets is statutory. Uh, and so um, we follow the statute. And one of the requirements for us when we're looking at proposed changes uh, to the forms uh, is about, you know, the forms are the minimum uniform credentialing information, not the kitchen sink of everything. Um, it's a lot like, you know, the minimum necessary standard for folks that are familiar with HIPAA. Um, and so there are times when we will go through and you'll see today uh, for folks that are new, um, there are some good ideas, um, but is that really something that um, you know should be part of of this these particular forms? Uh, the other uh, thing to keep in mind is that we tend to take sort of a longitudinal view of the world, um, and while something might be a good idea, it may not be ready for prime time, um, and so it might require a little study and further understanding before it's something that moves forward. It's not to say it, it, if it doesn't move forward, like today, for example, it couldn't be something that we pick up um, on, on future reviews. Uh, and again, with that, um, we want to be mindful in the back of our minds that, you know, these forms are something that go out and are, are consumed for public use. Uh, and having things that change significantly year to year to year presents sort of implementation operational issues um, for folks that are doing the credentialing work and gathering this information. And that's just something else uh, we want to keep in mind as well. So as we move into the next part of the agenda and going through uh, for folks that are, from, are new to this process, we're going to evaluate each of the suggestions uh, one by one. We vote on those. Um, and we have discussion on those. Um, you'll see it's a rather lengthy list. Uh, it can take a little bit of time or sometimes things move fairly quickly. We really don't know until we get into the, the process of going sort of, you know, proposal by proposal. Um, and we'll get a good sense of that uh, as we move forward. So with that, are there any questions from anybody before we get started? And Jonathan, do you have any other input? No, no, you covered it pretty well. Thanks, Mark. And I'll just remind folks, uh, our members of the public, if you do have comment um, after this process that we walk through, there'll be time for, for public comment, um, and we'll ask for that at that time. All right, so with that, um, Jonathan, are you going to broadcast anything, or are we going to stick with the PowerPoint? Uh, you know, I, I was just going to put up the Excel spreadsheet with all the okay. recommendations. It's a little bit easier to read. Yes. And, uh, Thank you. That I converted the, the Excel to PDF. It kind of distorted some of the lines like it usually does. So I'll just so bring you, up the if list. You could, if you could read aloud each one and then we'll take it up for discussion um, and then vote on it, that, I think that would be helpful for us. Can everybody see that list OK? I can see it. Anyone else having trouble? OK, hearing no uh, objections, I'll start out with recommendation number one, which was sent in by Doreen Nielsen, for, who is a medical staff coordinator at Curry General Hospital. So this is for the OPCA and OPRA 
on the peer references section, she suggests to add a box for the credentials of applicants peer references. So I'll open it up for discussion. I would vote that this would be applicable. Um, I know through our processes, we like to know that the peers are of the same um, license or degrees or above in some situations, but I leave it to the, the group, but that's just my recommendation. I agree. I agree as well. And it looks like there's plenty of room next to the name field, so. Okay. Um, and 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 I'm always open to folks that don't agree, uh, just so we're clear. Uh, and if you do have a question, I, I really do want folks to raise the question at the time before we take a vote, so that way we have good information to make an informed decision. Um, but it sounds like we've got good consensus here, so I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve. I'll move, I'll move to approve. And I'll second, Karen. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? OK. Any so all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion carries. Jonathan, item two. Item two, sent in by Catherine Therian. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, who is a senior market compliance consultant at Aetna. So for the OPCA and OPRA, on the professional liability insurance section, requesting to reduce the number of sections to shorten the application. I would disagree with this because I know at minimum we need a five year history. Um, and if the provider has changed their liability insurance each year to a different carrier, there could be a uh, potential for that. But I'll leave it again up to the group to discuss if you see any other reasons? Uh, this is Inga, and I agree. I think we should leave the five slots just in case they do change every year. Any other feedback on this one? OK, um, sounds like. We should entertain a motion to not approve. I'll take uh, that motion. Move and to move. approve. And a second. Or decline. Are we, are, what are we moving for? Are we moving to decline it? Decline, yes. Yes. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Any all in favor of declining this suggestion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. Uh, okay, item, item three, Jonathan. Number three. All right, again, sent in from Catherine Therian, Senior Market Compliance Consultant at Edna. So on the OPCA and OPRA, on page two, which is actually listed as page one, it's, um, there is a small box uh, right at the bottom of the page, which lists a few things. And instead of saying face sheet for professional liability policy or certificate, say declaration page. They didn't provide uh, actually very much justification for this recommendation. Um, so uh, I'll leave it up to the committee to discuss that. I believe it's more of a house cleaning scenario and if it's going to prove to be more cumbersome to make changes to the form for years it's been this way i think everybody that's in the system of credentialing knows what a coi or a declaration page is but again i appreciate what she's trying to come for forward with to call it out a little further I have no 
decision one way or the other. <laughs> Just a note. And, and that feedback's really helpful too. Um, any other input? Given that it is more along the lines of that more housekeeping um, sort of item, um, I'll entertain a motion to deny this one. I'll move to deny. I'll second. 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 Any discussion? Okay. All in favor of the motion to deny? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion carries. Thank you, Jonathan. Item four. Item four, uh, sent in by Catherine Therrien again. So on the OPCA and OPRA, this was suggested for flow of the application itself. So they would like to move sections six and seven further up under practitioner information, which would then ultimately become sections three and four. Again, preferential for house clean or housekeeping. Um, our offices have never had issues with the flow of the form. It's pretty standardized, but um, whatever the committee would like to just my input. I'm not sure where they're saying they want to move those sections up to if there would be like bring value into moving it somewhere else within the application. You know? Yeah, I think it's just Agreed. the flow of how they're going through the app themselves and maybe applying it to their own systems. I don't know. Yeah. I, I agree. I think because we don't know and there's not a recommendation, I don't see any issue with how the application is currently laid out. So. My my yeah. motion would be to deny it. We have Since a motion. No do, we have, do we have a second? I'll second, I'll second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion uh, to deny? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? All right, the motion carries. Thank you. Jonathan, item five. All right, item five, sent in from, by Catherine Therrien again. So on the OPCA and OPRA, move the healthcare licensure registration certificates and ID number section further up the application to before practice location information. Again, suggested for flow of the application was the justification they provided. I would say the same thing on this and number six. It's just jostling things around for a flow that may benefit one i'm not sure but again standardization is what people look at our form for and they know where to look but again if there's a workflow that um the group sees as bit more beneficial um, the I agree. only oh i'm sorry, sorry go ahead i agree to deny because you know folks are used to uh, looking at the same type of format year after year after year uh, and changing things will just cause more confusion. So I agree to deny. The only thing I was going to say was the only positive I could see about moving this particular section is that it would align more with the Washington State application in terms of where their how their sections are located. And I know that with Oregon and Washington, we do a lot of business. A lot of companies do a lot of business in both states, and that's probably why where people get the idea of moving the the IDs to be in that particular location. But I mean, I agree it's it it doesn't necessarily provide that much value and it it is a personal preference. So and, and your point is a good one, though. I mean, maybe it's something that we do take a closer look at, um, you know, again, under that incremental change. You know, do we want to take a little bit of studied look at what's going on uh, to our neighbors, particularly as there is a lot of sort of, I guess, cross border uh, credentialing work that's going on um, on this side, on the other side? 
of the pandemic. So um, I, I heard a motion, uh, potential motion, um, and we can go item by item, um, but if folks feel both item five and item six are very similar, um, I can entertain a motion on both of those at the same time, unless folks want to do want to go just item by item. I would. I would move to deny both five and six. I second. Is there any discussion? All in favor of a uh, motion to deny on item five and item six. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? OK, thank you. The motion carries. Uh, item seven, Jonathan. Item seven. So item seven was sent in by Tiffany Thompson, credentialing and provider relations manager at Trillium Family Services. So for the OPCA and OPRA, they suggested to remove text limits on all fields. Um, so for this one, you know, I, I put in my notes may cause a formatting issue. That was more of a question for the committee itself. Um, I know that we have unprotected versions that I send out almost on a daily basis for a reason. So uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on this matter. My only question is about the formatting. What would that take to be able to do that? And is it you know, cumbersome for the state to be able to make those changes? I don't know if it's the same process. I know when I work with PDF forms that there's a couple ways that you can make it so that more text fit into a field and it's either making it so the text shrinks the more you type which can be really difficult on an application the more the more information you put in there um, or it just keeps the text going through the field but it'll it'll cut off on the application you know so if you try to print out that application whatever goes beyond that field you'll no longer be able to see that um, so that's not really a good option either. So I mean, none of those options are are great options in terms of um, PDF forms. I don't know if if that's the same if same way that you use PDF forms. Yeah, it's pretty similar. And I, I can see just from my experience working with the publications last year on the 2021 applications that this could be problematic. And I think Ultimately, as long as OHA ensures that there's enough uh, space for whatever the requisite information is, then this should be unnecessary. I would agree. Um, the other thing is, I know in several sections um, that it says if you need more room, attach another sheet. And then we have the attachment at the back. So there are those options. I would move to deny. I would second. Second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of the motion to deny? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? All right. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, item eight. Item 8, sent in by Tiffany Thompson from Trillium Family Services again. So on the OPCA, Section 15, provide more space for their state health care licenses for providers who have worked out of state. Um, my one note is that we ultimately recommended to shorten or voted to, rec to approve the recommendation to shorten this section during our last meetings. I motion to deny because they, again, they can add another sheet to the application if they have more to add, uh, more licenses to add. I'll second. 
Any discussion? All in favor of the motion to deny item eight. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, the motion carries. Uh, Jonathan, item nine. Item nine, sent in again from Tiffany Thompson from Trillium Family Services on the OPCA section 17, professional practice, work history. They requested to lengthen this section for providers who have held more than four positions over the course of their career. I move to deny based on, again, they can add an additional um, document with additional information. Seconded. There you go. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All in favor of the motion to deny on item nine? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you. The motion carries. Jonathan, item 10. Item 10 from Tiffany Thompson again. So on the OPCA and OPRA, allow copying of sections so additional pages can be added as necessary. Can't we do this with the Word document? The unprotected version absolutely should allow you to do this. Yeah. So seemed a little bit unnecessary. I think she was more speaking to the protected versions that are posted online in the PDF form, which uh, I'm not even sure if is actually feasible. I move to deny. We have a second. I second. Is there any discussion on this one? Okay. Um, I Go ahead. Yes. I'm not 100% sure, but I can you also in the protected versions, are you able to extra, extract a page to make a copy of a page? You can edit PDFs to be able to um, select a page out. I've worked in PDFs enough that I know that you can like copy this page and make it a new document and then be able to work. I don't know if it'll be protected in the second version if you're only doing a snapshot, but I know that you can do it. But again, it's the um, technical ca capability of the user. Yeah, let me. Oh, you. No, you can't extract the page. I just tried. Never mind. Oh, Sorry. OK. I apologize. We have a motion and a second. We've, we're having discussion. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion to deny an item 10. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, the motion carries. Uh, Jonathan, item 11. Item 11, uh, Tiffany Thompson again from Trillium Family Services. So on the OPRA only, Section 3 Specialty Information, add a space between clinical practice and the check boxes that reside below for aesthetic purposes. Um, this is more of a obviously housekeeping thing and would be easy to change, but I'll leave it up to the committee's recommendation. I didn't check the OPRA. I did check the CA and it was clean. Um, on the OPRA, it would make the section match the section right underneath of other professional activities. Um, the formatting would be would mirror those in those two sections if we were to make the change. Yeah, so it would only be a change on the OPRA. And again, housekeeping. Yeah, it looks like, it, like Hillary was saying, though, it, it looks like it would match the section directly beneath it on the OPRA, though. 
it is a housekeeping thing, but. Yeah, and for folks trying to scroll through their packets, um, it looks like it's at page 31 of your packet. I would move to approve just for consistency. I would second. We have second. a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on this one? And right. all those in favor of the motion to approve. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. The motion to approve on item 11 carries. Uh, Jonathan, item 12. Item 12, in the OPRA, so to maintain consistency between the OPCA and OPRA, add one section to section 12A to make room for four affiliations and remove one from 12B to reduce application of process to two. I guess I don't understand the purpose of that. I mean, I could see where at reappointment there would be more applications exist or there would be more appointments existing than in process. So you'd want more room for those than applications in process. I could see that. my only comment <laughs> well again here it does say attach additional sheets too just like the other sections any further comment am i hearing a motion bumble to the surface <laughs> i would move to approve And just for clarity's sake, um, we're talking about the OPRA. And I, I just want to make sure folks understand that. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion to approve? I'm getting uh, I'm getting no real feedback there. All those in favor of the motion to approve. Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and the motion carries. Thank you. And again, if we need to re-vote on something, it's okay to say, whoa, wait a minute. And that's the point when we pause between the motion and the second. If there's discussion and we need to go back, um, you know, that's totally okay. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, item 13. Item 13. Last one from Tiffany Thompson from Trillium Family Services. It's on the OPRA only. They are suggesting to add more space to section 13A to expand work history to a full page as to accommodate providers who have worked in multiple locations. And just a quick reminder, this is OPRA, and in this section in particular, it is one of those where you can attach additional sheets. Yeah, and right now it looks the same as the OPCA, um, it, which we voted not to expand to a full page because we can attach additional sheets. Am I hearing a motion? Motion to deny. 
Is there I'll a second. second? Is there any discussion on this one? Okay, so um, all those in favor of the motion to deny? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, the motion carries. Jonathan, item 14. Item 14, sent in from Holly Schultz, the Chief Operating Officer at Prime Care. So on the OPCA only, on Section 17, Professional Work History, remove current and previous from the work history boxes. And the justification that they provided was it was restricting credentialing organization, organizations as some providers have more current than previous work locations. My, I'd like to add to the discussion. Um, for workflow and to verify gaps in work history, it is nice to have everything all in one. So you have your current and then the previous work histories below and they can attach another form if they need to. Um, so I, I'd prefer not to make any changes to this area. Because they would put it on two different pages of the app. You'd have current somewhere else and then the history. I think what they're saying is just removing the words current and previous so that the work history page just says name of practice slash employer so that you can so it's because right now just the first box says name of current practice slash employer and then all of the boxes underneath it says name of previous practice slash employer so it's limiting only one box to be the top box to be the current employer and they can have multiple current employers. I, I would totally agree with that. Thank you. I, yeah, I agree they, with that too, because we see that sorry. a lot. We, especially since COVID has happened, we've got, at least in behavioral health, I've seen a lot of providers working in two or three different clinics at the same time too. So I would agree. I would agree or uh, move to approve this. I'll second. This is why we talk about this stuff. Uh, is there any yeah. further discussion on this? I, I'm hearing something. <laughs> I'm just wondering if we should just do name of current slash previous practice um, so that folks don't get confused of what they should be putting in. You know, you just don't ever know with with providers. Well, and there's just a header at the top, though. I think they have to give five years. Is that five years on that one or is that the malpractice insurance? I can't remember. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that they could, you know, use two two areas as, you know, for the current practice and then the last two areas for previous, if you have name of current slash previous practice employer. Just, just a thought, make it more definitional, I guess, that they could, that they need to put both, you know. And I can't get to the PDF form because I'm in an outside um, meeting with you guys, so I can't get to the actual true form to read the header. Because it says work history on the top, correct? Correct. And then we have our description area underneath that, correct? Correct. Right. Please account for all periods of time from the date of entry into the medical professional school to present chronologically list all work professional and practice history activities since completion of postgraduate training, including military service. Please explain in section B any gaps greater than two months. Please attach, attach additional sheets if necessary. And I believe Dorothy, I can't read that. Yeah, I, I see. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> you click on it, it'll get bigger. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm just being funny. I can um, bring up the OPCA if that would be beneficial. No, I'm OK. I can see it. Um, so we again, we have a motion um, and a second on the table uh, to approve. We're in the discussion part of this, uh, so keep keep the discussion going. I would I would still approve to remove current and previous because it's ex explained in Section A of what they should be doing. But I understand Inga's perspective 
also, but it to me it would be adding a confusion, if you will, if we put current or previous. If they just have the dates, maybe I was gonna say here's another idea is put the two from at the top and then put the provider. But I know on the applications I processed, the providers will put any dates and any providers at will. They won't put them in chronological order all the time. So well, you know, and I agree with you about the explanation up on uh, at the top. It does say, you know, list chronologically and list from the time that you left medical school. So after reconsidering that, I, I'm fine with removing both current and previous. And there was a comment I saw that came up in the chat. Corey. But yeah, I just commented that possibly there's a way in Section A to emphasize that current employment is part of history. I think the only reason that it sometimes becomes an issue and is that some providers don't consider their current employer part of their history. I, I don't know why, but um, so just a thought. We could add to the second sentence if this makes sense to everybody where it says chronologically list all work including current practice and underscore it or something and we've got a real estate issue there yeah yeah well there is a, a, a bit of space down at the bottom of the page so even if it does add an extra line i i don't know I don't think that'll be an issue, but I'm going to leave that up to. Let John me ask the group this has in your experiences. Have you had an error or issues with providers completing this correctly? It's a good question. Mine is they're out of chronological order and I'm always having to do a little post-it note and put the dates down so I can fill in the gaps. So I know there's a. a process issue here if providers can't understand it. Yeah, and I, I do think the instruction and again. A lot of times this is. Something and this could be an FAQ uh, as an example. Um, it does talk about to present in the very first line yeah. of the instruction. Maybe just underscoring that whole that first sentence and italicizing it and still removing what's underneath it because um, like was said that a practitioner can have more than one current employer. Any further discussion and I'll, I'll recap so folks. We've had some good discussion on this. Any further discussion? So oh, what we have on the table. Wanted... Go ahead. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the only thing I just wanted to mention, um, you know, the, the current practice is listed in the practice information section, um, and they can list, you know, as many pages as needed for that information. Um, so I just wonder what the group thinks about possibly separating the two. So the current practice information is just listed in that section, um, and then the history is just meant to be history, and they would all be previous employment. So could I just ask politely who was talking just now? Oh, Since sorry, I that was Hillary. Oh, sorry, Hillary. Okay. Got too many screens open. <laughs> I was just about to ask the same thing, Mark. I don't know that it's necessary to s separate them specifically, but I know that. Um, I've seen a lot of providers not put their current practice on the work history page, and it hasn't been an issue for the reason that Hillary is saying, because they're supposed to put their current practice on the practice information page as well, um, or at least where they're applying to with us. Um, so it hasn't been an issue when they've left it off of that page. I don't know, at least in the places that I've worked. I don't know if it's an issue with other organizations. Um, so maybe putting the emphasis of the current practice on the work history page isn't that big of a deal. Um, and if they happen to put their current practice on the work history page, great. And if they don't, maybe it's not that big of a deal. I don't know. 
is it that big of an issue with other organizations? If we just remove the current and previous language and then leave the language as it is in, in the instructions. And, and that's exactly the motion that's on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Good discussion. Any further discussion on this? All right, so what we have is um, all those in favor of a motion to approve this suggestion. All in favor. Hi. <laughs> any okay, any opposed? Any opposed? <laughs> any abstentions? OK, so the motion to approve carries and just one chair note. Uh, Jonathan, what is the leeway um, in terms of emphasizing a word or two or underlining something for OHA staff? Do you need a motion on that? Yeah, I, I would say so. And I would uh, actually add that maybe it's beneficial to have the caveat there, that just a little line that says start with the most current instead of taking just taking those all together away. Because I think we can probably fit that in there without too much of a formatting issue. Just for clarification's sake, for the thousands of providers and people working to fill this out. I know that it's in the instructions, but uh, um, speaking for my gender, we don't like to read instructions a lot. So I should just say speaking for myself. <laughs> so that, that so on item 14, um, we voted to approve. And then we might need to add an item down below and item 20 from us uh, is what I'm hearing. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I wrote my thoughts in the chat if maybe we can add that in the second sentence. Chronologically list all work beginning with current practices and then proceeding with that sentence and like underline beginning with current practices. That would work. And Mark, I, I can't add an item 20 to the list of recommendations. Be so can, we add the sub, so can we add a sub part here? We can add a, a caveat to this recommendation. Okay. All right. So I like the efficiency. Um, someone sounds like they've had a little legal training um, with the words. Does anyone need that to be repeated? Let me pull that up again. And is that is there a motion on the table there? So is this a new motion? It would be it would be. Uh, to, to clarify this item 14, uh, the, the committee would recommend that the instruction part under the OPCA, after chronologically listed all work, add the phrase beginning with current practices with the S in parentheses. So do I need to so amend I, I, so, my someone, original? No, no, no. Motion? We've already okay. taken care of that one. Okay. We're adding a subpart here. Um, just need to know if this is something folks want to move forward with or not. Um, I have a quick question, actually. Sure. Is there, I'm trying to look ahead, um, and I don't see where it says to do this on the OPRA as well. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So um, I tried real hard to just list the application that the, the recommendation was pertaining to. So this one is just for the OPCA. Um, could... And then just so folks understand, the OPRA, uh, which is at page 35, does have different instructional language. So this might open up a little bit more of a can of worms um, for us. But it's a good comment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, even in regards to moving, removing name of current or previous employer, um, could we make a motion to update that on the OPRA as well for consistency purposes? I, and this is just the chair talking as a member of the committee. I yeah. I think we need discussion on it, but mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure it's necessary given their the purpose of the forms are a little bit different. Um, with the OPRA, you are trying to capture that past three year window. And I do think the boxes there reflect either current practice, current practice, previous practice, previous practice, previous practice. So there seems to be enough real estate there to address that three year window. Does that make sense to folks? And I'm open to all ideas on this. Are we muddying the waters? I'm still trying to figure out how we can implement the sentence that's in the chat into this um, A without confusing the rest of the language in it to make it a little bit more clear and cleaner. And, and we don't have to decide this today. This is something we can put on that list of, you know, incremental things that we flag um, and take a closer look at. So at this point, uh, given the pause, um, we do not have a motion um, on adding that phrasing uh, to the OPCA um, instructions. And so I'm feeling like perhaps we should move on and flag this as an issue that we take a closer look at down the road. Well, the current, just for discussion, the current um, language does say chronologically list which would mean you know from current to past though it's easier to comprehend um what dorothy had put <laughs> versus um but i, but don't I know. thought i just heard that most folks don't bother yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> they don't they they just put down what they remember and then fill in the gap from there <laughs> Well, with, with that, in the interest of time, um, I would recommend that we move on to item 15, but um, I do think this is an item that we should, um, you know, again, flag to take a look at because you do want to have that consistency when necessary between um, both forms, if that's called for. And I would re um, agree with your comment, Mark, about the three year history on the OPRA. You know, we're not needing a full history, so it would be appropriate to have two different descriptions in that section, which is applicable. And again, um, not to harp on the old FAQ thing, this is something that could be um, called out um, in an FAQ uh, question and answer um, okay. to help further clarify this. OK. Um, Thank you, this is a good discussion. Um, Jonathan, item 15. Okay, item 15. Sent in from Shema Hughes at Providence Health Plan on the OPCA only. Section two, practitioner information, add spaces for preferred pronouns, race, ethnicity, and indicate whether they read, write, or speak another language. I remember this discussion from last year. I'm sorry, Laura. Um, that, and I believe I brought up the fact of real D, where um, that's more of a quality matrix and not a credentialing standpoint. So um, I still believe in that, and it's not mandated by the federal government yet, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and until then, the committee was in agreement, at least last year, um, that we would not do anything on the application until it became formal. I think that captures the discussion nicely. 
Um, and again, um, going back to our statutory requirement about the minimum um, uniform credentialing information. This is an issue, though, that we do need to keep an eye on. Um, yeah. And I do think um, it's something that this group will be studying further down the road. Um, but I do think you captured that discussion. I just know that um, from our discussion last year that I had added that in our organization, we add a separate set of questions that the providers can answer to capture that information because it's not related to what is mandated in a credentialing. That is personal preference of acknowledging who you are and that type of thing. And I don't want to you know, disregard that by any means, but again, it's a different department than the credentialing and you would not deny somebody based on race ethnicity and their pronouns we that would be potential for um discrimination in my opinion and also just a side note there leaving, go ahead i was just i think leaving that information out of the equation as much as possible is helpful in terms of the uh, discriminatory um issues and just a reminder too, the statute does permit, um, you know, a credentialing information, additional credentialing information, um, to be asked for by a, a credentialing body. Just in folks, in case folks were concerned about that. And that's so, what our organization does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? I'll move to deny. Is there a second? I I'll second. I'll second. Any discussion? I just wondered if I could bring up, is there a consideration or is there a concern for discrimination instead of having gender and then the binary plus X, having gender preferred pronoun even or with or without and just let people fill that in? So the reason that we had it that way was to mimic the way that the Oregon DMV had it. They have male, male female and X was when we originally put that um, those genders. If I remember correctly. And I believe the medical board is the same way. If memory serves. Any further discussion? So we have a motion to deny uh, all those in favor of that motion to deny. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? All right, thank you. The motion carries. Jonathan, item 16. Okay, item 16. Sent in from Jeannie Pino, the contracting support coordinator for WVC Health Authority. So on both the OPCA and OPRA, Section 3 specialty information changed the link for the most current specialties list to the link is provided on my spreadsheet here and that IP address that was listed takes the user to codes listed on the X12 website. And what does ours take them to? It looks like they both go to this to the X12 website. But The one, the one on here goes to the taxonomy code list. And what are we truly trying to capture there in the specialty that for um, credentialing? How are the, how's this information being used? So the, 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 the link that was on the OPCA was like one link above this link that they're providing us. So it, um, if you look on the the page that was in the OPCA link, um, the taxonomy codes list link is on that page as well. If you scroll halfway down, there's just other links on that page as well for like claim adjustment group codes and claim status codes and error reason codes and stuff. Um, but this link goes directly to the practitioner uh, provider taxonomy codes. So it's just a more direct link to taxonomy codes. Well, I guess what I was asking is, all of us as organizations, when we're credentialing, is that what you're using to um, specify specialties? 
because a lot of my doctors and physic practitioners will not put in their taxonomy code. <laughs> I know a lot of credentialing softwares have the specialty linked to the CMS taxonomy code, um, which is is used for you know billing purposes and whatnot. But I don't I don't think every organization needs that or uses that. Um, I, what I'm I guess I'm trying to get to, and I'm not speaking for myself. I'm trying to yeah. get the group to look at it. Is is that the valid address that we want practitioners to use if we're mandating it on the form? It could be a housekeeping issue, or are we, if they're both valid email or, or web addresses, is ours the more accurate one versus the one that's being suggested? I don't think ours is the more accurate one because ours goes to a list of other lists including the taxonomy list and the other lists are not lists we would want practitioners to look at they would want to look at the taxonomy code list of specialties if if they are actually referencing a list of specialties that's the one they would want to use is the cms taxonomy code list so this this link in my opinion would be more accurate than the one that we have in the application because those other lists that are on the link in the application are not links that they would want to look at. I think it would confuse providers. They wouldn't know what link to click on. If you guys are actually, I don't know if you guys are looking at the different links right now, but um, the first one is is the one that's in the OPCA is a list of a bunch of different links that providers would not need to look at for the purpose of credentialing anyway. And I'm not. Um, here's one more question. How stable is this website that she's bringing? Is it a CMS website? Again, I don't have the ability. I think that's a, that's a good question too. Um, yeah. I think that sometimes you refer to the higher level hierarchy in a URL um, because the precise HTM or HTML page might change the, mm -hmm. the, the title of it. Um, I think this would be a way, the way it's currently done, and again, I'm just speculating here, uh, would be a way to get to a list, and then you probably have to go search for it. Um, Jonathan, any thoughts on the technical side of this? Uh, on the technical side, it, it wouldn't, I don't foresee any complications other than the fact that uh, what committee members just suggested, and the, it seems that the link that's been on the application for several years now has worked for everybody in the past and did you change it based on the recommendation of one non-committee member to a site that it doesn't seem like a lot of you are familiar with would cause some instability so um, yeah, what's the source so, of truth basically well i just went to the cms website and they actually refer to this this website um, it's the national uniform claim committee code set list so when i click on it they take you to this this website um so the the link itself is could this x12 thing that i don't know what it is but cms refers to it so it is okay. a valid site um i i know it's it is kind of housekeeping to update the link but again the the link that's in there it takes you to a list of i don't know 15 or so links that I think would confuse a provider and they wouldn't know what to click on to look at if they truly wanted to look up what their specialty was, what specialty they should select, um, where this link that this uh, that Jeannie provided um, takes them directly to the provider taxonomy code link. Can you see where the last revision of that list was made? Uh, July of 2022, July 1st, 2022. Any further thoughts on this? Any ideas for a motion? I move to approve the new link. Um, I think we should have the most up-to-date link. Uh, it sounds like there was some uh, uh, confirmation that was made that it is CMS approved. And besides that, I don't know. 
I don't know any one of our providers that have ever used this link, but we should have the most up to date one in case they do. Is there a second? I second. Okay. All those in favor of the, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion to approve. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? All right, the motion carries. Jonathan, item 17. Hey, okay, item 17, Senate from Jeannie Pino, the contracting support coordinator for WVC Health Authority. On the OPCA and OPRA, Section 6, practice and employment information, create separate boxes for mailing and billing addresses. Again, this is a credentialing application. Just my quick thought. I understand the need for a mailing and a billing. If this is a source of truth for the company to get information, yes, I can see a billing address being needed. Um, mailing address is the most appropriate for credentialing. Just my two cents. Always welcome two cents. Any other thoughts? Is there a motion on this item? Again, I can't see it. Here's an idea. In that section, when she says create separate boxes, is she talking about full, full section boxes or maybe a click, this is current, this is mailing? Would that I, be an I option? I interpret it as more real estate. That's what I That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I concur with that. It's adding a whole other separate box. Sorry about not being able to see these guys. It's okay. We can. I was moved to deny. Okay. Is there a second? I did not. A second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion to deny on item 17. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? The motion carries. Thank you. Jonathan, item 18. Item 18. Senate from Jeannie Pino, the contracting support coordinator for WVC Health Authority. So on the OPCA only, Section 16, Hospital and Other Healthcare Facility Affiliations, Part A, add a NA box next to admitting privileges for facilities that are not hospitals. Same for Section 12 on OPRA. I can see this being used for surgery centers. Because you wouldn't have admitting privileges to a sur surgery center, but you could be credentialed to be a provider with that facility. So what's the difference between NA and no? Do you have admitting privileges at this facil facility? Not so applicable. Yeah. Versus no, I don't. Because in a surgery center, you wouldn't have admitting privileges. But correct me if I'm wrong. It's just more of a defining line. Well, wouldn't they then just say no? I. I, I I, I yeah, I think you go, you go back to the in, instruction under this item, um, and again, I think there's probably sufficient explanation there if folks are reading it. Um, and you're either going to have privileges at a at a place that is doing that process, or you're not. I don't think there's any sort of quasi admitting privileges, if that makes sense. Forgive me, but what about a surgical center? It's usually a day surgery. 
to me, admitting would be more of admitting inpatient stays and that type of thing. But again, I'm not in a hospital, so any feedback on that? I'm wondering if it would be um, seen as there's a possibility to be approved for admitting privileges, but you just don't have them. That's the only way I could think that this might be seen as um, ne a negative. And I also looked at it as if it's a PA that's, because I used to work in an ortho clinic and the PAs would go in to assist, we'd credential the PAs. They weren't going to have admitting privileges, but they do have privileges to be surgical assists. So just looking at it at that scenario is how I was trying to apply it, though I know the hard for facility hospitals, it's the doctor has the admitting privileges type of thing. So that's what I was looking at. I kind of worry, though, about adding a not applicable option and having providers check NA in the event that they should really be checking yes or no for hospital privileges because they don't understand. But this says or other health care facilities. Right, but I, I, I do see where, you know, it, either you have the admitting privileges or you don't. And if you don't, it's also probably because it's not applicable in that environment, you know. So I, I personally see where it could have, we could have more issues having a not applicable box and having to go back to providers and explain to them, this isn't not applicable. You need to answer yes or no. That, that's just my opinion. So, so what I'm hearing that adding in a could add a whole bunch more confusion to this section. Yeah, I'm I'm more leaning towards if if it's not applicable, just yeah. check no. Okay. Any other comments on this one? Is there a motion bubbling to the surface here? Motion to deny adding NA. I'll second. Second. Further discussion. All those Again, I'm just Go looking ahead. at her. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Looking at her comment, though, um, Jeannie's comment says next to admitting privileges for facilities that are not hospital. That was her concern. Again, surgical centers would be that type of scenario. I think this is would be good for further discussion because in our area we have two surgical centers and we do try to find out if the providers um, like the physicians are credentialed there and can um, do surgeries. It's not technically admitting like a hospital admit, but it's a day surgery type of thing. So um, I don't know if we want to have a further discussion or just move the point at this point. You want us to flag this as something we Keep keep an eye on and look at. Maybe um, Ms. Pino may have additional information. Okay. I'm just being sensitive to that because they're a little smaller than hospitals, and if they are needing more information added to the facility or the contract, or sorry, <laughs> credentialing app, then more rationale would be appreciated. I think it's a good point, and I think it's something we could flag. Um, to get a little more information and bring it back to this committee. Sounds like an action item for me. I'll reach out to uh, Ms. Pino and see if I can get her to elaborate on the justification. Thank you. So we have a, we have a motion uh, to deny a second. We've had discussion. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to deny on item 18. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The motion carries. Jonathan, item 19. Item 19, our last item sent in from Jeannie Pino from WVC Health Authority. So on the OPCA, Section 16, Hospital and Other Healthcare Facility Affiliations, Part B, add more spaces for applications in process. And my note is that we also voted to 
shorten this section of the application back in 2021. So. I would move to deny since we shorten the section and they can attach more pages if needed. I second. If motion and second, any discussion? All those in favor of motion to deny on item 19? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, the motion carries. So we've worked through the list. Uh, Jonathan, before we move on um, to the public comment time, is there any housekeeping on what we just went through? And we'll come back to this at the end and explain the process, but before, after we go through public comment. Okay. Uh, no, um, one, one thing I'll just uh, mention is that, um, as I mentioned previously, there's going to be a little bit of reformatting with the applications that is not involved with some of these recommendations, just because uh, when we're going through the process in 2021, uh, oversight on my part was that I know the 2021 application doesn't have uh, initials on every single page and I wasn't aware that that was a requirement previously so we're going to be adding that back in and ensuring that that is consistent with applications before 2021. So, so this leads us to our public comment period. Uh, this is an important part of the work that we do. Um, it's always good to get input uh, from members of the public. So what I'd like to do uh, is folks that are from the public that would like to add comment for us, um, please either raise your hand or if you're on the phone, um, pipe up. We'd just like to know your name, uh, where you're from, and then what your comment is. Uh, and then uh, I'm I'm loath to put time limits on things. Sometimes you have to, but for now we won't have a time limit. We'll just see what you know who from the public would like to comment and come back to that if we need to. So with that, is anyone out there that would like to provide comment to the committee? I'm not seeing any hands raised in Teams. I'm not hearing anyone on the phone. I'll give it another bit of time here. There is a hand. Uh, so we have, uh, Judy Beck is, has her Judy. Uh, yes, I just had a quick question for the committee. If a facility is using medical staff software, can um, can we use the electronic application instead of a paper application? It's it might not match exactly, but it has the the foundations of the credentialing in it. So, you know what. It, what is the committee's take on that? Are y'all accepting the electronic applications through MD staff? Anyone have any feedback? Our office uses MD staff, Judy, um, as a health plan, and that's how we orchestrate our credentialing, we do it totally electronically through MD staff. Is that what you're asking? Or are you looking for applications going to OHA? I'm a no, little confused. no, that's exactly what I was asking. If, if they're accepting the electronic application that we use through MD staff, it might not be word for word, the um, paper application that Oregon has. So I was just curious, are we still allowed to use that? We do have several centers in Oregon, so we're trying to make sure we're complying in that. Well, I'll say this is our organization through MD staff. Uh, we worked with our liaison there at MD staff to um, pull the information into the OPCA or our OPCRA, and then we download that so we have it on file. Now, again, what not again, but I'll say this. If you want to reach out to me separately so we don't take away um, time from the committee, I can talk to you about that. But at the level of OHA, OHA doesn't credential 
using credentialing applications of providers. They enroll providers um, for the Oregon Health Plan. So I don't know if how familiar you are. Okay. Uh, yes, I understand where you're coming from and everything. So what you're telling me is that you your system is allowing MD staff to merge with the application, the state yes. application is what you're telling yeah. me. Yes. So yes, and that's what we're looking at doing too. So just wanted to make sure that we're on the same yeah. page. Yeah, reach back to ASM and tell them that you want to be able to merge your document. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yet another thing we may add to the FAQ page. Thank you, uh, Judy. Anyone else from the public who would like to comment? All right. Well, thank you. That closes our public comment um, period for this uh, committee meeting. Uh, and we'll go on to uh, next steps. Uh, and Jonathan, can you walk us through that? I know you had a flow sheet up above, but just to briefly explain the next steps so as folks that are new to the committee understand the process as well. Yeah, absolutely. So next steps uh, is largely for me to take the recommendations that were voted on and approved by the committee and incorporate them into the 2021 applications. Um, Working with my publications department will we'll, uh, finalize a rough draft of the applications and then I will send them over to the committee members to review and approve before sending them on to the OHA director for their approval before they're ultimately published online for uh, interested parties to use. Uh, and a couple quick notes as well. I'll also be sending committee members the draft minutes from this meeting so you can review them and uh, voice any questions, comments, concerns, or ultimately approve those. As well as um, the, yeah, no, that's it. Okay. Just making sure I'm crossing my T's and dotting my I's. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks for all the work that you do. Um, much, much appreciated. Uh, so before we uh, entertain a motion to adjourn, uh, are there any questions from anyone on the committee um, that they have for either myself or Jonathan or any other committee members? I, I had a question um, regarding, yeah, regarding Section L, um, physical, mental, chemical dependency question. Is that in its final form, or was the um, uh, the query um, to update that, is that being considered? So question L, we had a pretty extensive debate and numerous public comments on question L during our 2021-2022 meetings, and it was ultimately revised to reflect its current state, which, which um, application are you looking at in regards to how the question is phrased now? OPCA. Or is it is it the 2021 that you um, were sent for me? Yes, it's the, it's in the packet. Um, and it states, do you currently have any physical condition, mental health condition, or chemical dependency that currently affects your ability to practice privileges requested? Right, so the verbiage was changed, so it set states currently affects right. your ability okay. to practice, and that was what the committee voted on last time. Okay. Do you have any additional concerns about how that yeah. is? Okay. Is this the Go appropriate ahead, time? Ryan. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So, um, referencing a lot of information in the All In for Lorna Breen um, website, where they have a specific section. Um, that I can provide a link to discussing the most effective way um, to handle these types of questions um, pertaining to um, mental health uh, and dependent, chemical dependency issues. The, um, they have three recommendations for the best way to, to ask these questions. Um, and the way we have it as it stands, it would omit the phrase that um, for which you are not being appropriately treated. So 
asking the question, but not giving people the opportunity um, to attest that it's, you know, that it's an issue, it's under treatment. So you're asking the wrong question. In other words, asking, do you have it? As opposed to, are you taking care of your health? So it's a subtle difference. Um, and I would just uh, propose that we add for which you are not being appropriately treated. So, and there's a lot of evidence to back up doing that or changing to an attestation, attest, attest, I can't say the word, where you say, I pledge to take care of my health. And if I'm found to not be taking care of a problem, then um, that's the issue, not the issue that it's present. Um, and so there's a really beautifully done on the All In uh, for Healthcare or Lorna Brain site, uh, beautifully done uh, web page that they've created, and I can put a link in the chat. Um, but just to paraphrase their their top points, um, when you do that, when you either refrain from asking about health altogether, there's one option, to put in that that wording that you are taking care of your health, uh, and or three, just attesting that you will seek help as needed. Um, those are the things that put you in compliance for really, um, in their opinion, looking looking for uh, looking out for people's health. Um, the reason being that these questions, there's no um, evidence they actually protect the public, but there is evidence that it seeks uh, practitioners from getting care because it it's still just the asking of it um, can be threatening. Um, so there's a lot of evidence in there as well. Um, Vivek Murthy. In his U.S. Surgeon General's advisory uh, for 2022, discussed um, examining these types of questions um, so that there is no deterrence uh, for seeking uh, health care. Um, it's supported by research showing that up to uh, four in 10 practitioners will be deterred from seeking health care with uh, questions that are worded differently. Um, out of concern for repercussions. The Joint Commission does not require organizations to ask about mental health. Um, there's a concern that it could, um, could be a violation of the Disabilities Act. Um, there's a second survey I have, uh, they have reference to um, regarding, again, the same statistic, four in 10 would be reluctant to seek care. And then of course, Corey Feist uh, and his wife who uh, started the foundation uh, reference personally, Lorna Brain, who was an emergency department physician, uh, chief of the department who came down with COVID and specifically stated that she would not seek care due to concern for repercussions. So it's a really loaded issue. And I think this is a very specific, small phrase that can change the whole tenor of the question. And I will so, put the link. So yeah. that, Laura, this is good information. This is good to have. Um, what I'd like to do um is see if we could get sort of uh some more information pulled together for the committee to consider um i put this under that um rubric of you know the incremental changes to the form that improve the form over time um i think this seems to fall under one of those um there was significant positive improvement to the form um uh, between the the 2020 and 2021 uh, time period, but it sounds like from what I'm hearing from this discussion, there is room for us to consider further improvement to the form, and I'd like to get more background information for the committee to consider. Is that something you'd be willing to help me offline pull together? Absolutely. Okay, great. Is there any further comment on that? Dorothy? Yeah, one thing that I just wanted to um keep in consideration as well. It's not so much regarding the physical or mental health uh, portion of it, but um, in asking providers if they have any of these that they're not currently receiving treatment for, specifically providers who are w currently in a diversion program, if they were to answer no because they're currently in a diversion program, they're you know in compliance, they're receiving treatment, we still need to know that we need to contact that diversion program. We need to verify compliance of it. So not knowing that information, we, we 
answering no to that question wouldn't work in that particular scenario, and that's very specific to, um, you know, a chemical dependency issue, um, not necessarily the other two. But I just wanted to call that out because that's still something that we would need to be aware of and follow up on. Okay. Good. I think this is exactly what we need to kind of weigh and have a good discussion on. Anything else? Uh, there's a comment in the chat from so, Emma as well. OK, who's a guest there just for consideration? Uh, Emma is actually a member of the committee, it just says guest. I don't know why, but <laughs> let's make sure we capture that as well. All right, with that, I'm very mindful of our time. I'd like to give you back 10 minutes of your day. Uh, is there anything else anyone would like to add before I entertain a motion to adjourn? And I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. <laughs> Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Thank you so much for your time. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the, all the work that you do um, for this committee. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, and Jonathan will be following up with us. Uh, have a good day, folks. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good to Happy see you. New year. See you next year. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark, could you stay on for just a few? I can. Uh, thank you. Looks like we have, oh. Serena, it looks like you're still online. If you could hop off, I would greatly appreciate it. <laughs> I go ahead and stop recording.